Hey guys, the UK Chancellor has just delivered the spring budget. Today I want to unpack what was announced exactly, what does it mean for your personal finances, and I want you to be the judge as to whether this spring budget means that you are better off or worse off compared to where you are right now. Now, he started off the spring budget, and I quote one of the things he said was, he said, in a free society, the money you earn does not belong to the government it belongs to you. Now, let's just take a step back and just kind of remind ourselves, and I'll be unpacking everything in detail because I've written lots of notes here. Just remind ourselves for where we are right now in all our lives. Where we are right now, the reality of life is this in the UK. We have interest rates that are high, which means that people's mortgages are high. A lot of people have high rents that they're paying in different parts of the country. We have a severe cost of living crisis, inflation still remains at double digits, say 4% compared to the target for the government, childcare costs are very high, we have a huge uh, housing shortage in the UK, our personal allowances have been frozen at £12,570 and are frozen until the year 2028. Okay, and it carries on. Our public services are not that great. The UK economy is in a technical recession. And bear in mind, we were told about this growth direction, you know, more, about 12 months ago. And, and we're still in a technical recession. In addition to that, in addition to all these things I've mentioned, we are all paying more taxes than ever before. In addition to your uh, income tax, you are paying your national insurance, you got VAT, you've got various uh, duties to consider, you've got dividend taxes, you've got rising cancel tax, you've got vehicle taxes, and so on, okay? So with that backdrop, let's now unpack what exactly was announced today, and for us to come to some conclusion as to whether we are better off, or worse off potentially, based on what was announced today. So let's cut to the announcements. Now, I wanted to share um, a bit of uh, a, a bit of a, a background, particularly on the economy. By the way, the ASAT, uh, based on ONS data, Office for National Statistics, uh, UK growth stood at minus 0.3 percent uh, as at Q4 of 2023, and for the last 12 months, it's kind of hovered around zero percent. And tied to um, then I'm now going to uh, jump to what's announced relating to the economy specifically. It was uh, the OBR's forecast, the Office of Budget Responsibility, uh, basically put out that their their budget forecast, uh, the budget their, their forecast for the economic growth in the UK is this: they're expecting the economy to have grown by 0.8 percent this year. Bear in mind the history I just painted. Uh, 0.8%, 1.9% in 2025, which is an increase by 0.5% to uh, the autumn forecast that they put out not long ago. 2.5, uh, sorry, 2% 2 in 2026, 2% growth in 2026, 1.8% in 2027, and 1.7% in 2028. So by the looks of it, the picture they're painting, you know, with all the, ch all the when you factor in all the various things that uh, I'm gonna cover just now, seems to paint a picture of um, good things that are coming down the line. So let's begin with the very first thing that really stood out today. And the very first thing is that there is a 2% cut to employee national insurance. You remember in the autumn statement, we had a similar cut. So now there's a total of 4%. Back then, and it works out to be exactly the same now, for an average income of around 35,000 pounds per year, this works out to be the equivalent of £450 per year in savings for the original 2%. And when you add another 2% that's been cut on this announcement, it brings the total to £900 for somebody earning that average income I mentioned earlier. The question is, is, though, is this enough? Think about it. I want us to really be real. Now, on one hand, I accept this is great. You know, we've got these cuts. But remember all those various areas I talked about earlier. Is this a case of us being given with one hand and, you know, quietly, it's been taken away in other ways? Truth be told, given what we know so far, the numbers, when you work out the numbers, it would, it would, it would imply 
that we are actually worse off because when you combine the national insurance numbers and then look at the impact of the drag, effectively with, your, uh, with our uh, thresholds being frozen, with inflation, we are, you know, when you start to earn more, more people are paying more taxes. So that's the first point is that, yes, we've got this national insurance announcement and it would appear to sound great, but the truth be told, um, we are still paying a lot more over time. Now, there is another point related to this, and this is out of the hands of the Chancellor, but it's a very critical point as to whether we will see economic growth, because without the economic growth, we will not really have the GDP per capita increase, and there are many other things that this is connected to, tied to the overall prosperity of life in the UK. And that point is hinged on the Bank of England, okay? But I wanna just pause for a second just to thank the sponsor of today's video, and then I'll come back to this very point on the Bank of England. Now, passive investing is a low-cost approach to investing in a stock market using index funds and exchange-traded funds, or ETFs, in order to give you the market's return. XTB is a well-known online investment platform that offers stock and other investing services, and they are regulated by the FCA. They have launched investment plans to help you design a personalized portfolio of ETFs that align with your risk tolerance. And here's the best bit, all for 0% commissions and zero management fees up to the monthly investment volume of 100,000 euros. Mm. Once this limit is exceeded, a commission of only 0.2% is applied on a minimum of only 10 pounds. Wow. You can invest in over 350 ETFs, including ones that track the S&P 500. Create your account by clicking on the description link below to start investing today. Okay, so back quickly. The point I was making earlier about the Bank of England is that, truth be told, if you think about just broadly speaking how the economy works, it will really, for us to have this desire for growth and for growth to truly happen, we need certain ingredients for that to happen. We need a low tax economy, not just them telling us that we have a low tax economy or that we're being gifted or given low taxes, but a true lower tax economy. We need that as a first ingredient. The second for that to happen is we need um, interest rates to be lower. And of course, the Bank of England will not reduce uh, the current base rates until inflation is a lot lower. And at the moment, it sits at double their target. And the third piece we need and there are other things, but the third piece is improved productivity, which then helps to drive um, you know, various outputs and drives that GDP per capita, which, which is what we want in the UK. Now, tied to that point about inflation, it's been uh, the OBR forecast, the updated forecast that was announced today, after, of course, mentioning that we started at 11% inflation and it's come down to 4%, a lot of it driven by global events, I should mention. Uh, the forecast is that the OBR expects this to fall below 2% in just a few months' time. So this seems to imply that in about two months or so, we should expect to see inflation fall, fall, fall below 2% uh, target. Now, I think I personally think this is very ambitious, but I, I really want to wait and see this play out. So, you know, definitely watch this space and let's see how this pans out. Because if that happens, then then we'd naturally expect the Bank of England to reduce the base rate. And that then might create other, you know, knock-on effects positively in terms of helping the, the, the UK economy move forward from a growth perspective. But there are other things to talk about when it comes to growth. But before that, let me go into what uh, other things that were mentioned relating to households. Now, one of the things that really um, uh, is an important point for people in debt right now is a point around the debt relief order. So around 40,000 people will benefit from the 90 pound fee they usually have to pay for a debt relief order. That 90 pound fee has been abolished and this is, will be very welcome for a lot of people who are looking to seek a debt relief order as a way to try to get their um, their debt situations under control. Another piece is around um, alcohol duty, which has been frozen. Um, that duty freeze has been extended until Feb 2025 and will benefit, as I understand it, 38,000 pubs across the country. 
In addition to that, fuel duty, um, uh, which will be maintained, they'll maintain the five P cut uh, and freeze that fuel duty for another 12 months, which you know, uh, yeah, I'm sure is welcome for um, you know, um, motorists and, and businesses and so on. Now, one of the key areas that the Chancellor talked about is the importance of um, investment you know, in, in the UK economy to drive that productivity. So there was a lot that was announced around investment you know, across the country, and I'll come to some of them in a moment. But speaking to personal finances, um, one area, and, and for small businesses, one area of importance is VAT. So it was announced today that the VAT registration threshold is to be increased from £85,000 to £90,000, which would be a welcome uh, uh, news for um, small businesses, uh, small business owners, uh, and this will begin from the 1st of April. So this is really, really good news. Um, about the point on investment across the country, and this is an interesting one, £242 million of investments is meant to go into houses in the areas of Barking Riverside in London and Canary Wharf, yeah, as part of what they're uh, promoting as, um, you know, they'll, be, they'll, be, they'll essentially be building 8,000 new homes in, that, in those areas and uh, creating a, a life sciences um spaces in, in in those areas as well. Now, this is really interesting because this was promoted as effectively leveling up. And of course, we know that there are huge uh, housing shortages in the UK. So this is, this is really welcome. But when I did some research online, this sparked a bit of fury online because people are going, well, how is it that Canary Wharf needs leveling up? So, you know, not everyone has received that as good news, but it's definitely good news, uh, give, more broadly speaking, because there are housing shortages in the UK. And it's interesting actually thinking about that, if you think about it, for those who are um, you know, looking to get on the property ladder or maybe even investing uh, more generally, you know, with so much investment going into those areas, there will naturally be a ripple effect into neighbouring areas, particularly maybe even uh, areas on the Elizabeth line potentially. So it actually you know, kind of caught my interest when I heard about this because I thought this is actually pretty interesting and that speaks volumes to what they expect will happen in Canary Wharf over the next few years. Uh, other areas mentioned, particularly for personal finances, is that there's been a reform to the ISA system. A new British ISA is being introduced, which will allow an additional £5,000 to be invested in the UK, in UK businesses tax-free. OK, this is really interesting. Um, however, I was reading online uh, from various sources and there were some concerns being expressed as to um, the operational side of implementing such a change and why it might not be so necessary. Now, I personally think that I would have appreciated £5,000 boost, additional boost to the current £20,000 allowance, allowing people to have the option to invest wherever they wanted to invest. Of course, I get the whole point of investing in the UK because they're trying to boost the UK economy. I completely understand that. So it'd be interesting to see how this really plays out over time. But this is a pretty uh, big uh, announcement uh, that appears to be received well more generally. Another really big area relating to our personal finances is to do with childcare. Now, um, I, I understand from the Chancellor's announcement that the rates to be paid, because there's been an expansion in childcare, or there's a, a promise rather, of, of, of uh, uh, more childcare help for households, but whether people are going to get it this April that's coming or not was not clarified. So this is um, speaking to uh, childcare places available to parents, uh, who, you know, whose children from the age of nine months and above, right? So one thing that was announced, though, is that the rates to be paid to childcare providers has been guaranteed, okay? And apparently, this will lead to around an extra 60,000 parents entering the work workforce in the next four years on the back of this development alone. So... It remains to be seen how this actually plays out because childcare is a big, big conversation point and one that's affecting so many households across the country. So it remains to be seen whether all the promises actually leads to a reality where parents feel that they're being supported from a childcare perspective. I know for sure that many parents 
thousands of them uh, actually don't feel very supported and uh, don't feel like they are progressing um, you know in their in their kind of in their careers or household income and so on economically economically more generally um, because of childcare problems so this will be one to pay very close attention to to actually see how uh, all the announcements actually play out in reality as to whether parents actually do start to get those um, promises, start to see those actually become a reality from April. Now, one point that was made was about public services. We all know that public services remain a major aspect of what's necessary to create that productivity, to create that prosperity for the UK economy and so on. And, product, and public services require investment. And, um, and without the investment, you know, um, we, we wouldn't really see the, you know, the, that increase in uh, GDP in various ways. But one point that was really made, and I agree with this point, is that we need to run our public services more efficiently. It's about using uh, the money that we are we are paying in various ways in taxes and so on, but using that much more efficiently and, and just removing a lot of wastage. So this will play into the point around improving productivity uh, much more long term. Now, how that actually plays out, some of the things that were mentioned were, you know, um, building in more electronic systems into the NHS, improving their apps and so on. Uh, there's a point made around maintaining the 1% spend on public services, maintaining that uh, for much longer into the future, which seems to have been received pretty well. Now, um, speaking to uh, lower taxes, now, all these promises, the 2P, um, uh, national insurance cut and so on, all this needs to be funded from somewhere. That money needs to come from somewhere. So some of the new measures for raising money were as follows. There's a new vaping duty that's been introduced. Again, all of this is tried to obviously to raise some money, but to there's been a, a, a big rise in younger people taking up vaping, which is not really what the thing was meant to have, have, have been created for. But there's a new duty, which means you'll be raising more money for uh, for the government. There's a big announcement. Uh, oh, actually, before the big announcement on um, on non-dom status, there was a uh, a piece on higher duty on non-economy flights. It's interesting how he phrased it. He said non-economy, which basically means if you're flying business class or first class or whatever, you are going to be seeing your costs rise. Which I'm actually slightly frustrated about because I kind of think like. If people are kind of working hard and trying to, you know, you know, uh, seek out ways to save money and may, may then book these flights using points and what have you, this is almost disincentivizing them from that saving activity and so on. So it's interesting to see that higher duties have been applied to non-economy flights. Now on property taxation, this came up as something that will not be such good news for the buy-to-let market. So furnished holiday lettings has been, uh, they've abolished the regime essentially that offered some tax relief in that area. Um, this would not be received really well, but you know, um, there are reasons why they had to do that. There's also, um, they've also abolished the uh, multiple dwellings relief where you know people can buy more than one home in a single transaction that's been abolished today and you know will not be received well by property investors however tied to um uh, property taxes more generally the higher it tax at uh, the top level of tax from a capital gains tax perspective for um uh, for on property which is sits at 28 percent on residential property um the research shows that Reducing that will actually increase the number of transactions. So the good news they announced was that they're reducing that from 28% to 24%, which should come as uh, welcome news for you know people who are in that space who invest in property and and so on. Now, one big announcement that's been going on for a very long time is this idea around those who uh, around taxes by those who are residents in the UK, but who are not domiciled in the UK. So the so-called non-dom status is to be abolished and they're essentially getting rid of the outdated concept of uh, a domicile. And this is to be replaced with a fairer system effective from April, 2025, okay? There is some 
Um, apparently, this will raise, I'm told, this will, you know, listening to the translator, he said this will raise £2.7 billion a year until the end of their forecast period. There's a new mechanism they're bringing in for people who arrive in the UK who would need to pay tax for about four years. And then from four years onwards, they would then need to pay tax, pay UK taxes. So that seems to have been received pretty well. Another good news is on a child benefit. So essentially, there's an unfair policy that exists and it's very frustrating for a lot of working parents where, you know, if you've got two people who are working, one of them earns over 50K, you basically start losing your child benefit, um, which is frustrating, right? But you can have two people earning 49K, but they keep the full child benefit uh, entitlement. So what they're doing uh, effective uh, from April 2024, the threshold is going to be increased from £50,000 to £60,000, um, making it easier for um, more people to retain that child benefit. And it, it says here that, you know, from what the Chancellor says, it will save half a million families £1,300 a year. Okay, so you wouldn't pay any of the higher um, high income tax benefit. You wouldn't pay any of it back effectively under 60,000 60, uh, pounds from April, 2024. Up to uh, 80,000 pounds is where you fully lose all of it basically, but the tapering happens between 60 and 80,000 pounds. Also, uh, he said that this will increase, there'll be an increase of about 10,000, I believe the number is 10,000 more people uh, entering the workforce as a result of that happening. Uh, I already mentioned a, uh, the, uh, the savings in NI that I mentioned earlier. Um, the numbers related to the NI savings of 2% are that 27 million employees are to get a £900 on average, which is the autumn statement 2% and the current spring budget uh, 2%, £900 on average, and around 2 million self-employed people will get around £650. Uh, pounds a year as a saving. Now, the key thing actually tied to this, which actually was quite a big number, was that he announced that 200,000 more people will go back to work as a result of this NI cut, which I understand cost the government 10 billion pounds to implement. So a really, really big uh, number there, and it remains to see how this actually plays out. And, you know, just kind of zooming out real quick and coming to a point where I come to conclude this video real quick. There are many other things that are announced. I've just picked out the things that I think speak directly to your personal finances. The one thing I wanted to just summarize uh, and say is that I think this budget was um, somewhat fair, but not enough. It was not enough because I think the Chancellor has done what he he, he can do within um, you know the limitations he has uh, while still trying to maintain the debt to GDP ratio of the UK and you know general uh, you know public borrowing and so on and while still um, trying to make sure that he's helping out you know individuals as well as small businesses and so on but there is some massive omissions um, and I wanted to just speak to uh, as some of the things that I just think um, you know, a, 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 a good but somewhat questionable. So the first one is that not everybody um, will benefit from the NI, um, NI cut. So people who are of state pension, uh, state pension age will not be benefiting as a result. So, I mean, what do you do for those guys, right? And then you've got a situation where people's personal allowances have been frozen. And for a lot of people, this will be the first time they're actually starting to pay income tax because inflation means that their incomes are rising. But, you know, this is a problem for a lot of us because, like, you know, we feel like, yes, on one hand, we've been given, you know, these NI savings, but there's this big piece on, you know, you're effectively getting poorer quietly because you've got those frozen personal allowances. They used to rise by inflation, but they're no longer rising by inflation. The other point I want to highlight as I conclude is that, yes, there's a new British ISA that's been introduced, but the reality of life is that a lot of people can't even see any money left over at the end of the month. What is the point of a new British ISA if, like, if you're not even able to save more generally? You don't have £100 left over or, or however much left over at the end of the month. 
So yes, that will be benefit some people, those who are high earners and, you know, and that's great. But for a lot of people who are much lower earners who really could have done with lifting that uh, uh, frozen threshold for our personal allowances, that really would have helped people on lower incomes. So I really think that's a massive omission, not even an omission, but something I just really, really wish they had done something about with this particular budget. Um, just looking here real quick. Oh, the other thing to mention as well is, is that there was no help really, if you think about it, in this budget for people who earn an income from investments. There's nothing, there's nothing really offered uh, for those people. So, um, uh, and the final thing I want to wrap up by saying is that the OBR have said that because of the frozen thresholds that I mentioned, I've been talking about in this video, um, they've estimated that 1.1 million more people will be dragged into paying higher income taxes and 800,000 more people will be forced to pay uh, higher rate tax as a result of it as well, okay? So overall, I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments. What do you think about this particular spring budget? Yes, on one hand, there are some good things. There's the NI, there's the child benefit, there's you know uh, the VAT threshold. There are a few things that have really jumped out, you know. But if you really think about it, they're also being paid for from various other areas. Um, that might also be affecting you. And one of those core areas is the fact that your personal allowances still remain frozen. And as a result of it, you are quietly paying more taxes. I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments. What do you think of this spring budget? Do you think it's a, are you receiving it as a fair budget? Or do you think, do you know what, overall, it sounds good, the headlines are great, but the truth is the UK economy is not really growing, you know, we're still in a technical recession, the cost of living is still high, inflation is still high, prices are higher even though the inflation rates dropped, we're just not, prices are just not rising as much. And there's so many other things we could talk about. I'd love to hear from you guys in the comments. If you enjoyed today's video, really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button right there somewhere. Spend 10 seconds, hit that button and show some support for our channel. Other than that, Thank you guys so much for watching today's video. And as always, in all things, be thankful and seek joy. Take care. Bye for now.